Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental dash training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator welcome welcome to dental webinar series today we have uh, two wonderful presenters and uh, they're going to do justice to the topics that have been assigned and uh, the first presenter is uh dr najla kasabre dr najla welcome to dental webinar series thank you so much dr Ubo. All right, uh, before we go ahead, I'm just going to go and read out uh, Dr. Najla's uh, uh, bio and we're going to get started. Dr. Casabrea graduated from the Ohio State University School of Dentistry and in a master's in periodontics in 2019. She's originally from Jordan, where she received a DDS at the University of Jordan in Amman. Uh, Dr. Casabrea has had uh, clinical experience in private practice as well as strong research experience at the OSU. Uh, during the program, Dr. Casabre was selected as a chief resident. She also received an award from the Midwest Society of Periodontology uh, uh, poster presentation uh, competition for graduate uh, student research forum award in 2019. Uh, she was a finalist for the IADR prestigious Edward Hatton competition in Vancouver in 2019 and for the uh, Balint Auburn competition at the AAP in Chicago in 2009. She is currently a clinical rec lecturer at the University of Michigan. Uh, I I'm just so blessed to be part of the University of Michigan. Uh, it's one of the top universities, uh, dental schools around the world. Dr. Casabre, you are welcome. Uh, please take it away. Thank you so much for the nice presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen now. Uh, welcome everyone for my uh, webinar. Um, I'm very thankful for Dr. Ubo's uh, invitation for me for, to do this uh, presentation. He actually suggested this uh, topic and uh, it's a very nice topic to talk about. There's a lot to talk about it, so I try to be um, as simple as, as much as I can. So uh, my topic will be about perimplant disease, the new classification, diagnosis, and the current treatment. So uh, I'll be covering um, very briefly the difference between implants and teeth, especially from a biological aspect. We'll talk about the 2017 classification, uh, the difference between two terminology, survival and success rates, and uh, what are the risk factors for periimplantitis and what treatment is available right now for that disease. However, before we start talking about treatment, it's very important that we can diagnose. If we have a case, if we have an implant with symptoms, with signs of inflammation, it's very, it's very important for us before do, in order to do a proper treatment to be able to diagnose. And in able to diagnose, we should know the basics. Um, so very uh, briefly about basics, we all know that uh, Implants is not a new topic. Implants were, were placed uh, uh, from old ages, but the material was different. In the mid 60s, Brenmark placed his first uh, titanium implant. And since then, the implant dentistry has changed a lot. Uh, we, uh, we all know that there's differences between implant and, uh, and uh, natural teeth. Uh, from a biological point of view, the, the teeth has bundle bone, bone around it. There's also cementum and there's a periodontal ligament that goes in between these two uh, uh, parts and also the uh, soft tissue. Uh, in, around the implants, we don't have bundle bone. The, the bone around the implants osseointegrates and uh, this is how bone is um, in contact with, with, the, with the implant. 
and the bone around implant is a mixture of lamellar and bone marrow and the amount of fibers and osteoid cells is less compared to, uh, to, compared to teeth. These differences in biology can also attribute to the differences in the mechanics of uh, between implants and the teeth. As you know, um, teeth move differently uh, than implants, uh, they, uh, how they receive the occlusal forces. Uh, teeth also have nerves around them, so uh, the perception of feelings uh, is different uh, between implants and teeth. The collagen fibers around implants is parallel, uh, and this is also different. another difference between implants and teeth. Teeth has these fibers going from different uh, uh, directions. They have different orientations. They come from cementum to, the, to bone or to, or to soft tissue or from bone to soft tissue uh, or from soft tissue all around. So there are different, uh, they have different orientation. But around implants, it's only parallel. And also there is no cementum around implants. So when, when we probe around, te around teeth, uh, and compared that around and, and compared these the probing depths around implants, your probe will get um, um, you know uh, you will have a greater probing depth because of the lack of these kind of fibers. So we place implants with there are implants uh, been there for a while and uh, People thought that, yeah, you place the implants, there are no issues. And then after a while, we started noticing that these implants might have some issues, uh, whether this issues is related to the bone, to the soft tissues, to the prosthesis. Um, so, and there was no classification. Uh, until 2017, where the AAP Word uh, Workshop had uh, this classification, uh, for peri-implant diseases and conditions, and it included the peri-implant health, peri-implant mucositis, peri-implantitis, and peri-implant soft and hard tissue deficiencies. Um, but before we jump into these, uh, uh, you know, classification and de define each one, uh, let's talk a little bit about the difference between survival rate and success rate. Because when you read papers, when you read the books, uh, you can have these definitions, but uh, sometimes they alternate, sometimes they are misused. So um, for a survival, for, for an implant to be, to be to survive, this means that the implant is merely placed in there. It's, it's in the oral cavity. It does nothing, it has nothing to do with uh, whether it's functioning or not, whether it's buried or not, whether uh, there is bone loss or soft tissue loss around it or not. Survival rate merely means the presence of implant, and the 10-year survival rate of an implant is around 95%. On the other hand, success rate is related to the presence of an implant with certain conditions. So there are certain conditions that can be looked at, whether clinically or radiographically, to determine, to determine that the implant is success. And the 10-year success rate of an implant is around 90%. These criteria can be checked again clinically or radiographically. Clinically, the implant should be immobile. Uh, there should be uh, no signs of infection, uh, pain, or uh, paresthesia, or any signs of inflammation in general. Radiographically, there should be no evidence of radiolucency around the implants, and the annual bone loss following the first year of loading should be not more than 0.2 millimeter. So if we go back to the classification, the first one is the peri-implant health. And as we've just been talking about, health means the absence of any clinical signs of inflammation. Uh, so there's no erythema, there's no swelling, the tissues are pink, they're firm, uh, there is no uh, uh, perfuse bleeding upon probing, there's no suppuration. Uh, pocket depth is a little bit uh, challenging uh, because you cannot give a range. It might differ, be different depending on the height of the soft tissue. And there is absence of uh, bone loss following uh, the initial uh, bone remodeling. 
Good implant mucositis is an inflammation around the implant uh, mucosa, but this inflammation or this infection does not include bone loss. This kind of inflammation is reversible, but if you compare it to um, gingivitis, um, Perimplant mucositis takes longer time to heal, and the response, the inflammatory response, is more pronounced than gingivitis. So you would see a red swollen soft tissues, and there will be profuse bleeding upon probing. There might be some suppuration. The probing dips are increased if you compare it to baseline. But the key point here is the absence of bone loss beyond the uh, biological bone loss or, or biological remodeling that happens after the initial uh, uh, one year of service. Um, Berry implantitis, on the other hand, is the inflammation uh, that uh, occur in mucosa around the implant and uh, involves marginal bone loss. So there will be a visual inflammatory changes. There will be uh, redness. Um, there will be bleeding upon probing with or without suppuration. Pocket depth will increase and there will, there will be an, a progressive bone loss. Um, however, sometimes uh, patients comes to you and they're not your patient, so you don't have the initial radiograph. So if you don't have it, um, the presence of bone loss that is three millimeter or above with uh, or without a probing depth that's six millimeter or above with profuse bleeding uh, rep is representing a case of preimplantitis. Here's a case where an implant was placed and after several years, you can see that there is uh, uh, some amount of bone loss uh, around the implant. And uh, you can see the clinical uh, picture, you can see uh, that the bone loss is around the implants from the both sides, distal and also from the back side. And you can see some threat exposure. In this uh, paper, they attributed the bone loss around the implant to the presence of cement. And actually, this clinical photo is after cement removal. The prevalence of preimplantitis is around uh, 18% um, if we talked about patient level. Um, and if we talked about implant level, it's around 13%. So um, as scientists, we were, uh, we were asking the, that question, what contributed to the bone loss? Why this implants? We thought that this implants will be placed, we will have no issues. So what, what happened? What, what factors are uh, associated with, with uh, this bone loss? And right now, uh, there are multiple uh, factors that uh, are being studied. Uh, and uh, some of them, they have strong evidence of being the fa factors for preimplantitis, and some of them have promising uh, evidence, but more studies are needed to confirm it. As you know, in order to have uh, um, uh, something as a risk factor, we need to have longitudinal studies to confirm uh, its effect. So, uh, History of periodontitis, poor plaque control and poor compliance are the only two risk factors with, uh, uh, with the strong evidence uh, of, uh, their core, uh, of their association with periimplantitis. And uh, more evidence uh, is still needed for the other factors, but as for now, the evidence is leaning towards them being risk factors or still inconclusive. And these uh, factors include the smoking, diabetes, keratinized mucosa, the presence of excess cement, genetic factors, systemic conditions, iatrogenic factors, um, occlusal load, and the presence of titanium particles and soft tissue around the implant. So again, history of uh, periodontitis is one of the risk factors that longitudinal studies suggest is strong evidence. Actually, um, the studies are showing that uh, the, inc the, the incidence of periimplantitis is 29% in subjects with history of periodontitis as compared to 6% in patients uh, without periodontitis. And uh, the, the frequency of implants with pocket depths uh, of six millimeters of 
uh, or more increases with the increase of the severity of the uh, periodontitis. Also, lack of compliance if the patients are not coming for regular uh, visits, for maintenance visits, the incidence uh, of periimplantitis rises to 44% in these non-compliant patients as compared to 18% in patients who are compliant. This is one of my cases, uh, a 60-year-old male. Uh, he comes and he needs, he was told that he needs a periodontal treatment, but um, he has this implant on the lower right side and uh, the radiographic uh, x-ray, you can see uh, that there is bone loss around this implant and uh, around the tooth next to it. Uh, uh, the clinical photos, you can see the signs of inflammation. You can see the redness around the implant. And upon probing, uh, the, the pocket depth was around eight millimeter pockets from the mesial side and the distal side. And there was a profuse bleeding and suppuration. So if we think about these risk factors that we were talking about um, before, um, when, when, when we took the history of the patient, the patient um, stated, confirmed that he has irregular dental visits. Um, so he never, he, the, the, implants was, the implant was placed seven years ago, but he never came, went back to, the, to his dentist for regular cleaning. Um, he also has a history of periodontitis uh, as we examined the full mouth and he never had, this was never addressed and he never had any treatment for his preimplantitis, so for his periodontitis. So implants were placed before addressing any uh, of these issues before. The patient is also diabetic. So uh, this could be a, um, a risk factor also that we can add for uh, the, for the preimplantitis uh, situation that we see here. This is another case. The implant, these two implants were placed in 2014, and you can see in, within six years that there is a um, significant amount of bone loss around this implant. And if we think about um, factors, we can also um, start thinking about, this is not my patient, so I don't know his, his, the history, but you can uh, think about the social status, uh, um, medical conditions, uh, occlusal loads, uh, so these are, so the, you always should look about, uh, at the reason uh, so that you can treat the disease. This is also another case, it's a case of mine, never had an initial x-ray, so uh, I don't know how it was, but you can see that there is a radiolucency around the uh, whole implant. The implant was mobile when I examined it, so the implant was failing at that point. And here's another situation where the bone loss is very severe and uh, it's going all the way to the apical part of the implants. So let's talk a bit about treatment, but before jumping into treatment, oh, sorry, let's talk about treatment first. So uh, for uh, peri-implant diseases, uh, the important thing to know if this implant is mobile or not. So if the implant is mobile, the first question that you should answer, whether the implant, whether, which, which part of the implant is mobile? Is it the fixture or is it the crown or the screw? So if it's the fixture that, so you have to remove the crown and the screw to determine if the fixture is the one that's moving. If it's moving, then the implant is failing. And at this point, you have to remove the implant. If not, if the loosening uh, or the mobility is coming from a loose screw or crown, then we, you need to check the occlusion and you need to check for fracture of the abutment or the, or the prosthesis. If there is no mobility, but there is signs of inflammation, this means that the implant has peri-implant picositis or peri-implant peri-implantitis. The difference is again the bone loss. If there is no bone loss beyond remodeling, then this is peri-implant peri picositis. And in this uh, situation, uh, the treatment includes non-surgical uh, mechanical debridement uh, with or without adjuncts such as mechanical, uh, chemical agents that we will talk about later on. 
if there is evidence of bone loss, this, then, then the diagnosis will be periimplantitis, and the treatment depends on the amount of bone loss. If we have uh, mild bone loss, let's say less than 25% bone loss, then the recommended treatment is um, uh, also non-surgical treatment, the brightment and the use of other materials. But if we have a moderate bone loss between 25 to 50% of bone loss, then um, what determines the treatment depends on the uh, defect type, whether it's supra-bony defect, uh, or infrabony defect or a combination. In this situation, you can uh, treat with uh, osseous resective surgery, implantoplasty, or you can be do bone grafting or a combination uh, in case of a combined uh, defect. If the bone loss is severe, if it's less than 5%, 50% and it's, um, it's an uncontainable defect, uh, the treatment, the recommended treatment in this situation is to take the implant out and develop the site for future implants. The other thing that should be taken into consideration is soft tissue augmentation. Uh, as I stated before, uh, uh, the amount of keratinized mucosa around implants is uh, one of the potential risk factors for preimplantitis. And at the moment, the recommendation is uh, to graft around implants if the amount of keratinized mucosa is less than two millimeter, or if it's, uh, if the, uh, if the patient has a thin biotype, thin biotype of uh, mucosa with liquid keratinized uh, tissue. But before we jump into implant placement, there are a lot of um, multiple factors that we need to take into consideration. Um, placing an implant is easy. You just open the gums, you drill, and you, you follow the, the sequence and, and that's it. Anyone can do that. But um, and before you do that, there are certain things that you should take into consideration so that your implant uh, ends up as a successful in implant, not as a survived implant or a failed implant. It's very important to review patient's health history. Is he diabetic? Is the diabetes controlled? Does he take anything that modifies bone, like bisphosphonates? Uh, how is his oral status? Is he, uh, does he have good oral hygiene? Does he take care of his uh, own teeth to start with? Uh, does he have any history of periodontitis that was addressed before, start, before placing an implant? Um, is he a smoker? Does he drink alcohol? Um, it's very important to review anatomy, especially these vital structures when, when you're placing the implant. Um, how, how, uh, away am I from, uh, you know, the nerve or the sinus floor or like a main artery um, before you place the implant? Is the site ready to place the implant? Is there enough bone to engage the implant? Um, is the soft tissue quality around the implant fine? Is it thick? Is there, is there enough keratinized mucosa? Um, is, there is there interoclusal space for to place the implant or there's nothing? Um, also, um, it's very important to know that this implant should be prosthetically driven because, yeah, you, again, you can open and place an, an implant, but it might not be able, we might not be able to restore it prosthetically. So placing an implant should always be prosthetically driven uh, to, in, for a successful implant. Um, before you treat, you should spend time with your patients talking about uh, home care instructions. They're not that different uh, from, you know, the home care for uh, natural teeth, the brushing, the using of the interproximal uh, instruments as well. So patients should know uh, the importance of home care. They also should know that it's not only one visit where they placed the implant and that's it. It's there for it, it's there forever. They should know that implants should that they should come for regular visits for the regular maintenance, uh, so that if something happens or if something that looks abnormal, it can be caught at an early stage, not when there is a fifty percent bone loss or when the implant is mobile. As for treatments, I'm gonna start with the non-surgical treatment. Non-surgical treatment is mainly used if you have a peri-implant mucositis uh, or if you have a mild bone loss. In this uh, situation, you can use a plastic curettes or gold curettes 
uh, a perfect brush or cup. Um, the ultrasonic or sonic uh, um, um, driven uh, um, instrument using a plastic tip or an air polishing with glycine powder. So you can see here the Capitron tip that's covered with a plastic tip that is uh, used for implants. And the top one is showing you the plastic uh, uh, curettes. Uh, a very important thing to mention is that uh, usually treatment of preimplantitis is not a one treatment. It is uh, combined with other things and this is where uh, the detoxification or decontamination com concept came. So usually uh, you can combine the surgical or the non-surgical therapy with uh, uh, the addition of uh, some materials or the uh, whether or some mechanical treatment so that you can enhance the outcome of the treatment. The detoxification, uh, the aim of it is to remove the bacterial debris, the plaque, the calculus, the cement, uh, so that uh, to enhance the soft tissue healing and minimize the presence of plaque. The detoxification can be mechanical or can, can be chemical. And um, according to a systematic review, uh, that compared uh, these the different um, methods, um, there was none, none of them was superior to uh, the other. Uh, and uh, the usage of one of these agents with an active slap uh, was the best treatment uh, that you can provide. So for chemical uh, decontamination, you can see, you can use materials such as saline. Saline, uh, you can soak a pellet. Uh, with with the saline and uh, you can burnish the surface. Um, saline usually reduces uh, the uh, lipopolysaccharides. You can also use a citric acid uh, same way. Uh, citric acid detox detoxifies endotoxins. Chlorhexidine also can be used. Um, you can use it uh, in a gauze or irrigation or you can uh, uh, tell the patient uh, uh, to use it for three to four weeks uh, at home. Uh, as a reference, um, CPCs as well, uh, hydrogen peroxides and antimicrobials. Antimicrobials can you be used uh, either locally or systemically in order to, to decrease the bacterial uh, load. This is uh, a situation where a flap was opened and the tetracycline was used um, locally to decontaminate the, uh, the surface of the implant. For mechanical decontamination, you can use the pumice that you use for polishing, uh, or you can use an air powder with a glycine, um, and the, uh, it, it removes the microbes and uh, it has a minimal surface alteration. Lasers also are coming um, uh, part of the mechanical decontamination, uh, especially the ERIAC lasers. Um, the, the idea of using laser, lasers is that the laser causes necrosis of the cell, bacterial cell, because of uh, protein denaturation. Also implantoplasty, where you can use the rotary instruments to uh, smoothen the exposed uh, threads, or you can use a titanium brush. This is an example of, um, uh, this is an example of, um, Implantoplasty. You can see on the uh, um, on photo A that there is um, there is some bone loss around the implant. A flap was raised in um, photo B, and the the rotary instrument was used so that these exposed threads are now smoother, as you can see in photo C. And also, you can see that, uh, and uh, you can see that radiographically that uh, the ex these threads are now smoother, so that it's not an area where plaque bacteria can, uh, you know, uh, get stuck. The one thing that you need to remember about implantoplasty that it might be tricky if you have a thinner implant or a narrow implant because if you you know, thin it, uh, thin it more, you might jeopardize the implant and increase the chances of, uh, of its fracture. This is an example of using a titanium brush and so you can see these bristles of the brush can go and clean in between the threads so that to remove any uh, debris, any calculus or bacteria. 
So when we have a preimplantitis that with mild, with moderate bone loss, uh, we can open uh, a flap, uh, or even if we have a mild, you can open the flap and add any of these materials uh, to your treatment. Open flap is usually um, indicated if you have a horizontal bone loss. And uh, a systematic review found that the, re the pocket depth reduction with this technique is usually around two millimeters. You can have a resective surgery where you open the gum again, but uh, you have also horizontal bone loss or non-containable vertical defects. So you can reshape the bone so that it so that it will be more cleansable. And then once you adapt the tissues, it will be a uh, um, uh, nice adaptation uh, so that the patient and the dentist or the hygienist can clean in a better way. And uh, the mean reduction in pocket using this technique is also two millimeters. If you have um, a, an, a containable uh, intraboni defect, or if the non-surgical treatment that you start with was not effective, uh, then you can uh, do a bone grafting. You can open the, uh, uh, you can, you know, reflect the flap and clean around the implant. And then if it's a containable um, defect where you have a two wall defect uh, or three wall defect better, then you can add some bone. You can also uh, uh, cover that, that bone with membrane. And currently um, we have a lot of, uh, membranes, we have a lot of uh, bone substitutes, but uh, currently there's none that's superior to another, uh, according to co some consensus. Uh, the mean pocket reduction when, uh, when doing a bone grafting is around two millimeters, and you can see uh, evidence of bone fill radiographically of about two millimeters as well. This is a case where uh, you know you opened and you can see a circumferential bone loss around the implant, but you still have the walls, the, all the walls are around. Uh, so in that situation, um, bone graft was added and then uh, the flap was closed. So the take home message from my, my today's webinar is that it's very important bef to, before you know, uh, placing an implant to uh, think about how to place it, where to place it, and uh, when to place it. It's very important to have a very um, uh, um, a good oral hygiene, no sign, no current inflammation or infections, um, favorable uh, bone, uh, bone type, bone, um, um, bone thickness, favorable soft tissue thickness, um, interocclusal space is, is good, implant is prosthetically driven when placed. It's very, this is your part. And the patient part is that he should be motivated. He should be willing to come for compliance. He should have a good oral hygiene because treatment of preimplantitis can be challenging. It's, um, I'm, I'm, I know I've been showing you some pictures and uh, uh, of the treatment options that we have, but treating preimplantitis might be uh, challenging and it's not always straightforward. And I usually tell my patients when I'm telling them that um, the treatment plan is to place an implant, how important it is to keep the main, to, to come for maintenance because treating preimplantitis could be more challenging than treating uh, periodontitis. Treating it, a defect around teeth uh, has more, out, more predictable outcomes than treating a defect around preimplantitis. And um, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm not sure, Dr. Ruvo, do you want to give questions now or later on? Okay, yeah, if, you, if we do have, uh, I'm gonna check, I think we do have um, on the Q&A, someone, uh, there's a question here. Um, uh, you will answer that then if there's anyone who will do it after the poll. Uh, it, the person says, uh, Dr. Uh, there's a dental student here. He says, what's the expected duration of bone loss from the time of implant placement? So uh, at the time of implant place, so once the implant is in uh, function, we are expecting some bone remodeling and it shouldn't, and this bone shouldn't be more than two millimeter uh, around the implant. And annual bone loss is expected, but it shouldn't be more than 0 0.2 millimeter. Okay. All right. Uh, we're going to run the poll. Um, uh, 
just one minute here. Dr. Jeff Wang, do you have anything to say? Sorry, I'm, I'm picking on you. I know that um, you, you are able to speak if you want to, sir. Oh, thank you for pointing me out. I didn't expect this. Um, yeah, I think I'm just echoing uh, what Dr. Kaspar is saying. Um, I think the initial bone remodeling is, um, it's a very in-depth question. Um, and there are many factors. We now know the tissue thickness plays a role. And, you know, ideally we don't want to have any bone loss. So it's important to set a baseline. And, you know, that baseline should be, you know, at the time of the restoration. And from that on, moving forward, Ideally, we, we don't want to see any bone loss. And that's kind of the current uh, hot topic about zero bone loss concept. And, um, you know, that really also, there are many studies looking at the emergence profile and prosthetic design, uh, how that influenced the uh, crestal bone remodeling. But overall, like what Dr. Kespra said is uh, 0.2 millimeter bone loss per year as a reference. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we don't want to see any bone loss ideally. Um, that's my... All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that um, impromptu um, thing there, but, but thank you so much. But I'm looking forward to having you. Uh, I guess I will reach out to you later on uh, as your time permits. I'm going to go ahead now and just run a poll um, based on Dr. Kassabre's uh, presentation. Uh, we have like uh, four minutes. We do have another presenter, Dr. Uh, Fura Judge, is going to be speaking about the, the implant program at the University of Michigan. Um, but before we, we, we get to him, I just want to uh, run this poll. We have like four minutes. Please, let's uh, answer uh, the, the, the question. The, the, it is quite, um, you got to be able to pick the right um, option. They are pretty close, but uh, uh, Dr. Casabra, I, I believe you'll be able to uh, review at the end of the poll the right, the right uh, answer option. Mm -hmm. All right, so we're running now. We have like, uh, uh, let, let me give you five minutes just to read through and, and answer as much uh, as you can.
We've got two more minutes. Uh, please, let's go ahead. We can, we can get to 100%. 100% of uh, everyone can just give your answer option. And you know, there's no, uh, this is not an exam. This is just to test whether you, you got some of the concept. We have two, uh, I'll say two minutes to go and uh, we would uh, stop the poll and review um, the questions. All right, so I'm going to end the poll. Uh, Dr. Kasabre, please go ahead and, and review the, the questions. Dr. Najla, can you hear me? Uh, everyone can see the poll, right? Yes, yes. So just go okay. ahead. Okay, so um, for the first question, it was criteria for a successful implant. Um, which one is included? What does it include? And 44% answered slight bone loss annually. And this is the correct answer. Uh, a bone, an implant that is mobile or has signs of inflammation or has a slight uh, radiolucency, has any radiolucency at the, the bone level is not uh, considered as a successful implant. Okay, the second question was, in the absence of initial radiograph, the periimplantitis can be assumed if 52% uh, of the people answered the bone loss that is three millimeters and or probing depths that's six millimeter and above with, perf with profuse uh, uh, bleeding, and this is the correct answer. For the uh, third question, the prevalence of preimplantitis, 48% uh, answered the correctly. It's around 20%. Um, it's around. It's actually 18.4% according to the uh, uh, recent studies. Um, so, if we have a mobile uh, implant that, or the fixture is mobile, what's the treatment? Um, that was, I think, a tricky question. Uh, only 28% answered the correct answer. If we have a mobile fixture, this means that the implant is failing and uh, there is no osteointegration. integration. And at this point, uh, implant should be removed. No bone grafting, no resective surgery, or non-surgical therapy, none of them can help with, it, with, um, with, a, with a fixture that is mobile. Um, the best mechanical or chemical detoxification agent, as we said earlier, um, na, uh, as, at, at this point, there is nothing that's superior to another. So most of them are showing uh, good results, but most of them are not using solely. They're using in combination with each other or in combination with a surgical or non-surgical therapy. So at this point, we don't have any agent that we know for sure that is superior to another. For the last question, bone grafting is indicated in case of, um, most of the people answered horizontal boneless. 
when you have remember that for bone grafting you need to have a containable defect and if you have a bone loss that's horizontal like that there's this is not a containable containable defect right so it's very hard to add bone the, this bone will not will not last but if you have a defect if this is the tooth the implant surface and this is the defect then you should be able to and all something like that so so you have a two wall defect or if it is circumferential like that in this situation it's if it's containable this is when you have to you, when you can add bone for the treatment but if it's horizontal it's really hard to contain the bone so you this bone will not last there there will be no further osseointegration so uh, the correct answer for bone grafting it's uh, usually when you have a vertical defect that's containable all right thank you thank you so much thank you so much dr Casabre, for that very uh, uh, wonderful presentation uh, um, like i said it's going to be available on, on youtube so we can go back and review the material um uh, that you know and um, you, you should be able to do that uh, later in the day uh, Healing Hands Health Society presents Dental Webinar Series. We have planned a series dental webinars to keep you abreast of current practice. This series on prosthodontics will be via Zoom, Facebook Live. Presenters are drawn from dental schools in the USA, private practitioners from around the world. To register for future webinars, visit www.hhands.org backslash dental training. For future inquiries, contact facilitator 